Since the 20s, there's always been a following for jazz music in Britain. From the Bohemians to the Modernists, from the Beatniks to the Existentialists. But following the success of the style known as fusion in the late 70s, jazz music in Britain fell into an almost terminal decline. It took a handful of obsessive young DJs searching for an alternative to London's new romantics to reintroduce it to the dance floor where it belonged. The whole idea about acid jazz is that you make the room shake. You know, you get the whole thing swinging. The joint was swinging, and that's what acid jazz was all about. Paul Murphy and Giles Peterson's legendary jazz dance nights at the Electric Ballroom and the Whiskey A Go Go during the mid 80s set the scene for a jazz renewal. The music was hard and fast, 60s blue note alongside frantic Latin instrumentals. The crowd were multiracial and the dancers obsessive. Jazz was back with a bang. It's about freedom. It's about, you know, breaking people's perceptions of what they might dance to. All was fine until the acid house explosion. Overnight, vast crowds flocked to illegal raves and jazz was in danger of being forgotten. By rights, the scene should have died under a wave of ecstasy. Instead, it was reborn. It probably was started off as a bit of a joke, like, like a lot of these things do, you know, like funk, for example. Funk means depression, you know, so how that got turned around to mean you know, rather rhythmic music emanating from sort of New Orleans, God knows. London was really segregated for a long time, and certainly when, in as far back as the early 80s, then you're talking about clubbing still being a very, a kind of, sort of elitist West End thing, very kind of fashion dominated and things like that. What happened with the rare groove scene was that suddenly that started to really break down social barriers and it brought together, if you like, Hampstead and Hackney. That was the kind of, the areas that it was hitting on. So suddenly that was in, in itself, those barriers had already started to break down with the popularity of the rare groove scene, which was, you know, the whole roots of dance, the explosion in dance music culture, which could then happen with house. The seeds of that were all very, very much sown previously to that. The chance addition of the 87 buzzword, acid, to a flyer allowed Peterson to mix musical styles to an extent never seen before. Blue Note next to Blue Beat, Public Enemy next to Jimmy Smith. Almost by accident, a whole new scene developed, acid jazz. What came first was the name, acid jazz, because the name came about as a bit of a joke, you know, from Chris Bangs, Nicky Holloway, Giles Peterson, there was a kind of little gang of about 10 of us that were um, basically just hanging out and, and the acid house scene was so big so quickly and within about a month we decided to call our label after this kind of jokey buzzword that, that you know was being used on flyers and stuff. We came on after Pete Tong and he'd been playing his kind of early house stuff and um, there were all these big screens all around us and they were projecting onto them and there was just Giles was playing this old Art Blakey, really have heavy Afro-Cuban record. There was this big sign saying, acid, acid, acid. And he just stopped the music and said, acid jazz. And it was like, we just sort of looked at each other and collapsed in fits of laughter. Acid jazz came out of the jazz dance scene. And the jazz dance scene is about as pure, in its original form, is about as purest as you can get. It is about a bunch of guys in a darkened room sweating to a kind of music that only they really can understand, you know. And that's about as esoteric as you get. All dance music is about rhythm, so of course acid jazz is, is very much about rhythm, but I think acid jazz was about an opening up of rhythm, and it was about, um, yeah, it is about the funk, but it's also about, it's about jazz, it's about freedom, it's about, you know, breaking people's perceptions of what they might dance to, you know. The whole mission, in a way, of what was going on with Dingwalls as a club was to really push that, and I think Giles Peterson really did. I mean, there were times when I think he amazed me, and I thought, you can't play that, you know, it's not going to work. But, you know, we really tried to stretch people's idea of what, of what dance music could be and the feeling that you could have with it, you know. Dingwalls, they used to have a song yeah. they do at Dingwalls, and it was a kind of crossover between rare groove like the, and the kind of jazz funk 
scene and and then giles and people would would rummage around and look for you know fantastic old rare soundtrack black exploitation kind of stuff and and it, it wasn't like a dance scene you know it was all about going and and dancing mm. but then it's kind of acid jazz is a bit of a, a nebulous I don't know, we, we made a couple of records and we used samplers and for us then it was acid jazz, it really was the thing because you were the hybrid of the, you know, the new technology and, and what you were already doing as live. But some of the other acid jazz artists, you know, they stayed with that live sound and they didn't get into it sampling experimentation and, and, you know, so for us it was all about, you know, the, the combination of the two. I remember kind of jazzy house, you know, being played uh, at Dingwalls and uh, certainly hip hop. So all that kind of got pulled in on, on the umbrella, but jazz based dance music was already very well established all over the country at that point. The Acid Jazz label were punting out stuff which ranged from rock music, sort of early 70s inspired rock music, through to Latin music, uh, with jazz and funk and soul in between. So that's, that's pretty broad parameters, you know. And I think the fact that it was so amorphous and broad is what led to its own demise. Um, because in, in the world of marketing, if you can't really hang your hat on something and say what it is, then you're a bit lost. I mean, rap music was in there as well. And, but you could sort of say it's 70s and funky and then it's classic jazz, you know. Mondays at the Wag was like, we started it in like 83, I think it was, and we began kind of with um, Working Week who played there, and it was, uh, then it was a big thing. They did the Vence Ramos video and all the jazz dancers doing all the spins and black backflips and all that. And at first it was mainly kind of people dancing, you know, black guys dancing to a mixture of kind of like um, Brazilian love affair and John Clemmer and all that. But then it got much harder and much more 50s and much more, Beat Nicky, and then within it by a few years we had like Slim Gaylord playing there, Art Blakey, and we had a really hardcore of devoted people, followers every week, we'd have five or six hundred. The thing about Acid Jazz was, um, it started in a very small way with about a group of a hundred people that used to go and see Giles Peterson, and within, uh, you know, within three years, most of the bands came out of that scene of a of hundred people, you know, the Young Disciples, the Brand New Heavies, Jamiroquai, The Influence, Barry Sharp and Dinah Brown, and James Taylor Quartet, you know, all these people came from a tiny scene to become, plus the DJs as well, like Peterson, Patrick Forge, Chris Bangs, Kevin Beadle, Russ Dubry, a lot of big DJs came out of a very small pot. And so it was just, it was a creative time and we were lucky to be in the right place at the right time. JTQ was going a long time before Acid Jazz, the term was coined. And Enemy had already kind of laid hands upon us and said, yeah, this is a good band and they, they do kind of indie rock. You know, we had number one singles, number one albums in the indie charts. And they took us very seriously. But then Giles recognised that what we were doing wasn't really indie rock. Okay, so there was elements of that there because we were basically just rock and roll musicians. We couldn't play like Herbie Hancock. But he could see what, what we had been listening to was Herbie Hancock, was Jimmy Smith. We could see that it was a black jazzy thing. You see, so it was different things to different people. So Giles kind of came along and said, look, this is where your music comes from. I mean, he was very educational towards me. He helped me a lot to understand where I was coming from and this is where it could go. And he, he put us in front of magazines more like ID or The Face. It was that sort of 80s, living it large, and, you know, we were all kids on the dole, and, you know... It's hard to get into... Just, we were into dressing up and playing music in a, in a basement squat. You know, we were fortunate to be, you know, really the first band to come out of the scene to sort of make it in America. We had, you know, we had a number three R&B with Never Stop. 
in like 80, in 91 or 92. And um, fortunately that woke up England's ears and we got a record deal here and then we started touring around the world and Japan got hold of it, it was going around Europe. But um, we were just doing our thing, you know. There were a couple of dodgy covers we had to do just to sort of cross over, but you know, if you want your job, you've got to put up with a couple of things, haven't you? <laughs> Acid jazz was there were certain elements of clothing that went with the scene that were obsessive, especially in the first few years. Hats was one of them. Rob Gallagher from Galliano always used to wear a little mus Muslim hat, you know, years and years ago, 15 years ago, uh, or floppy kind of hip hop hats. They were always quite in. But trousers, I think our trouser, <laughs> as the anal uh, collector in me, was a pair of probably 1968 Levi Big E's or a pair of Duffer Check kind of um, hipster trousers for men, which, which they did in about 19... I've still got two pairs in my wardrobe, actually, in about 1988, 87. Duffers, you know, Duffers definitely was the place to go to get your clothes. For, for the ID photo shoot, they said, um, wear this and this, and, and we put it on, you know. It was flat kind of pimp hats, and leather hats, and flared trousers and stuff. And we put these clothes on, did our photo shoot, and then put our jeans and <laughs> airwear boots on and went home. You know. There was two looks to the acid jazz scene, I think. The, the two looks, the casual look, which is basically, you know, the little Muslim hat on the head and little waistcoat maybe, a pair of jeans. Obviously, a goatee at the time was a quite a, a big deal, long before the sort of footballers picked up on and made it sort of pretty naff. Um, of course, I suppose even shaved heads were quite uh, significant, wasn't they? Sadly, I have to keep mine shaved to this day, but yeah, it was a big thing. And then on the tailoring side, there was two looks that I really did, which was like, was doing stuff for the Young Disciples, Brand New Heavies, people like that. It was like the real sort of 60s, sort of modernist type look we were doing for them. Uh, three or four button suits, very slim cut trousers, cross pockets, stuff like that. And then of course the stuff I was doing for the Brand New Heavies, which was very much on that sort of 70s rare groove tip as well with the hipsters, with the flares. I did some great suits for Andrew Levy, did like denim suits, wonderful denim suits, big peak lapels, really sort of nice boot cut trousers as well. I think Acid Jazz did have its own trousers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, they were probably, uh, they were probably kind of slightly 60s kind of check, um, worn with trainers and a denim jacket. That would have been your Acid Jazz trousers. The fashion was a little bit like the music. It was quite sort of off mainstream, but off the mainstream, do you know what I mean? It was like Big E Levi's. I mean, you know, it's partly responsible for the whole 501 thing coming up, because there was guys wearing, wearing sort of outfits that people wear now, but you know, the first time round, even just simple stuff like just denim jackets and things, but the way they were doing it with a bit of style and like loafers with no socks, that was a big look. <laughs> All the Duffer boys and that, they were, they, were, they were very sharp sort of thing, East End, sharp and crisp, but not suits, more like casual. In the early stages, it was, um, it was quite kind of 70s y kind of derived, you know. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the kids who were into it didn't have stacked loads of money, so they'd go in funky little second hand clothes shops in Camden Market, places like that. And I think you know, with, with some of the bands that came along, like Mother Earth and some of that, it got kind of almost a hippie kind of 70s rock thing. It got very kind of retro, 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 which was not really what we were about in the first place. So if there was a look, that, that I guess became it, the kind of, you know, the sort of pre-Jamiroquai, beardy kind of hippie, hippie 1970s, which, which Funny enough, was the exact look that made me first start going to soul clubs in the first place, because I wanted to get away from people who dressed like that when I was a kid. After the initial kind of West End trendy thing and suburban London cool thing, it, it was a student thing, definitely. And it still is to a degree. The majority of our support and uh, record buying comes from, from students. But I think it's quite easy to wear that kind of hippie. It was a mod hippie hybrid of clothing, which just suited students, I suppose, because it didn't cost a lot of money. And a lot of it was second hand, you know. Flares, 
No one had seen flares before the brand new heavies wore them on top of the pops, probably for 20 years. So we are responsible for that kind of stuff indirectly. I mean, this was a, this yeah. was a sort of thrift store scene. It was cheap. We were all a bit doly kids. It wasn't like sharp, you know, Yamamoto kids of the 80s. It was it was kind of post that. You know, we were all on the dole. We were all just, you know, trying to make music, trying to make a living. I think the thing that kick-started acid jazz was the ecstasy revolution, if you like, following the summer of love in kind of 87. A lot of people took acid and ecstasy and consequently broke down the boundaries and, and the strict barriers that existed in youth culture before that. I think without that ecstasy thing, uh, probably things would be very different today. But I, I don't also think that it was a particularly drug-based thing, acid jazz. I mean. Scenes are often defined by the type of drug that, that dictates the pace. And I think one of the healthy things about acid jazz is it's not a cocaine scene. It was, you know, there was never really much cocaine around, which, which is creative and healthy, you know, to not be part of that, because that's fundamentally defeating. I never thought of the acid jazz as a big drug scene, you know, a little spliff in the back corner of the bar or something like that. I think the thing about ecstasy is, ecstasy just is, you know, it just works with house music and I think if you've got a lot of people in a club on, on, on E then, then it kind of has to be house music, it has to be constant tempo, it has to be pumping, you, you know people don't want to hear sax solos, they don't want to hear noodly guitar riffs, they just want pumping music you know and I'm not sure if that's what that acid jazz thing was all about. In music, there will always be the new underground. If anything's going to be successful, it has to be underground enough that it kind of attracts the attention of the press, but it's got to have some kind of accessibility that you can just reach the ordinary kids, and, and it's got to go beyond that sort of, uh, you know, that kind of elitist thing and, and be more widely accessible, I think. soul music and the, and the Jamaican music, the black music, which is about bondage and about liberation from bondage, speaks directly to people that are brought up in working class culture in England. It was a fantastic, you know, little movement, a little scene, and at its heart was diversification, really, if anything else. You know, it wasn't a specific scene, but it pulled in all manner of people, and the, the, the do's were quite funky and they were quite happening. The thing that was always at the centre of it was a kind of love of soul music and, you know, it may have been tinged on one end with Eddie's kind of punk DIY ethos that he had, let's, let's do the show right here type thing, but on the other end it was like, you know, it was just kids getting in bands and they were playing funk and they were, you know, they were buying all the compilations, they were buying the Blue Note comps, they were buying um, Charles's Acid Jazz comps that he was doing of old music and they were buying, buying the new comps, they were buying our Totally Wired things, we were doing acid jazz, they were buying all these things, and they were just throwing them in. It was, it was probably the first time where a scene that was so based on kind of a reverence to the past, it suddenly allowed people to go, well, I heard Giles play that, and it's been reissued this week, I'll go and get it. And yeah, but at the same time, I'll buy the new Galliano record, I'll buy the new JTQ record, I'll buy, or, you know, the new hip-hop record, the new Tribe Called Quest record, sampling all the jazz records. It's, it, was, it was the first time that that was possible, I think. I think acid jazz, as a scene, still exists today, um, but they just call them freestyle nights, of which there is hundreds and hundreds, not just in this country, but all over the world. The music policy is still exactly the same. Uh, it, it's, it still encompasses the old and the new mixed together and black music right across the board. Um, I just think that people um, just got a little kind of sick of 
acid jazz this and acid jazz that and 100% acid jazz and blah 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 and and there were so many bands jumping on the bandwagon and the, the, the it, it got so watered down you know um, I, I wish I wish I could turn back the, the, the clock and get rid of you know 90% of the records that were made in that scene all the bandwagon jumpers there are people who are still into punk there are people who are still into and creating British hip hop and there are people who are still into and creating an eclectic acid jazz movement. I think that it's a movement that's had a longevity that popped up and got its day in the sun and then continued. So I still get a lot of work playing James Brown records, James Taylor Quartet records, Brand New Heavies records, alongside records that may have been released by Nathan Haynes last year or, or other young, new, British sort of acid jazzers. I think music owes everything to Black America. I think without Black America, we'd probably all still be into uh, either Kraftwerk or like Liszt and Wagner <laughs> and all that European stuff. So without Black America, we'd be a very barren landscape indeed, culturally, I'd say. Oh, I'm in a sad mood tonight. Within two years, acid jazz blew up worldwide. Jamiroquai became an international superstar and dozens of other groups achieved enormous levels of commercial success. But with success came dilution. The original eclectic outlook of the movement was superseded by the inevitable overkill. The phrase acid jazz itself became a marketing tool for corporations looking to sell irrelevant products. Musical horizons were still broad, but the influence of trip-hop and jungle took over the underground market and set the scene for the next generation of youth culture.